revolt. We cannot sit down. We cannot let go. We cannot pretend. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. This week, protests across the country have called for justice in Sandra Bland's case. Here in New York, at least a dozen people were arrested Wednesday after sitting down and locking arms in the street. They also raised questions about the death of Kendra Chapman, an 18-year-old African-American found dead in her jail cell in Alabama just one day after Sandra Bland was found dead. Chapman was arrested July 14th on accusations of stealing a cell phone. She was found unresponsive in her cell 80 minutes after she was booked. Just like in Bland's case, authorities have claimed she hanged herself, but her family does not believe it. At the protest in New York, demonstrators also mourned India Clark, a 25-year-old African-American transgender woman who was found beaten to death Tuesday in Tampa, Florida. These are some of the voices from the protest. And I'm a second year in college. I go to the new school. I actually came out because I was informed by one of my friends that this was happening. And all the time, this is actually my first protest. It doesn't seem like it's a very well-known topic since, like, things like Eric Garner and everything, like, everybody knew about that, but not many people knew about this. So I felt like it was my duty to, like, spread the word about what had happened. So it felt more urgent to me. Say her name means that... She's not forgotten, that her spirit lives on, and that her presence is here, um, and that she has a voice, and that her lives matter. And because her life matters, all of our lives matter. I am Kalisa Moore of People's Power Assemblies. My organization um, put this demonstration on today because we, um, we really just want answers, um, answers to questions we, we already know, what happened to um, Sandra Bland, what happened to Kendra Chapman, what happened to Kayam Livingston, what happened to I Ayanna Stanley Jones. Um, we all, we know that, you know, we live in a country of white supremacy that is continuing to kill black and brown people, both men, women, and children. And Basically, we organized this because we are fed up and we're no longer taking it anymore. My name's Kimberly. I've been with PPA for a couple of months. Well, I've been coming out anyway since the fall for Mike Brown. And a few months ago, there was a rally for Rakia Boyd. And you probably heard only about 25 people showed up for that. Um, so ever since then, I felt like it was very important whenever something happens to a black woman to also show up just because... It's disheartening to see that we don't get the same numbers, really, as we do when a man is killed. So I wanted to come out in honor of her and, you know, just respect her life. I just feel like it's our responsibility as black women to mention it, because if we're not even mentioning it, no one else is going to know. The lives of Sandra Bland, India Clark, Renisha McBride, Ayanna Stanley Jones, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice. Jimmy Powell, Paul, John Crawford, and so many others will be the focus of a major movement for Black Lives convening in Cleveland this week. And people from around the world are expected to attend. From where we go directly to Cleveland, where we're joined by the three founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, Patrice Cullors, is the director of Truth and Reinvestment at the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights in Oakland, California, founder of the Dignity and Power Now, a grassroots organization in Los Angeles fighting for the dignity and power of incarcerated people and their families. Alicia Garza, is Special Projects Director for the National Domestic Workers Alliance, and Opal Tometi is Executive Director of the Black Alliance for Just Immigration. We welcome you all to Democracy Now! Um, Alicia, why don't you begin on the significance of what has taken place, what you're doing this weekend, and the death of Sandra Bland? You know, this weekend, over a thousand people are coming together to commemorate the lives of those of our family members who've been taken way too soon from us by police terrorism and state violence. And also, we're coming together to build a vision for the kind of world that we want to see. We want to see a world where black lives matter in order for us to get to a world where all of our humanity is respected. And Alicia Garcia, Garcia could you take us back to when you uh, coined the term Black Lives Matter, and then link it again to what's happened in Sandra Bland's case. Sure, of course. I mean, when Black Lives Matter was started, it was a very similar moment to this, where uh, Trayvon Martin had been murdered by George Zimmerman, and George Zimmerman was acquitted in that murder. So while George Zimmerman got to go home to his family, Trayvon Martin's family will always have an empty seat at the dinner table. And we decided to design Black Lives Matter as an opportunity for black folks to come together, 
to love on each other, to celebrate our resilience in the face of such adversity, but also to come together to organize and to build our social, political, and economic power to change our conditions. And what's happening here with Sandra Bland is no different. Sandy Bland was driving, minding her own business, and that traffic stop ended her life. And we all have questions about what happened in that jail cell. We have questions about why was she pulled over in the first place. But the larger questions at stake is why do black lives have such little value in our society that they can be taken at whim with no answers, no accountability, and no justice? Um, Patrice Cullors, if you could talk about, well, the allegation is that she hung herself, that Sandy committed suicide, that she had expressed that she had attempted suicide in the past. They didn't put her in a suicide watch, if, if this is all true. Uh, you deal with issues like these of people who are in prison. Yes. I don't believe uh, Sandy committed suicide. And unfortunately, this issue of uh, people found hanging in their cells is very common inside U.S. jails and prisons. Um, on, for one, oftentimes, guards are killing people inside U.S. jails and prisons, and then they're hanging them to cover up um, the death and the murder. And then secondly, for those folks who actually do commit suicide, it's often because they aren't being cared for in the hands of sheriffs and the hands of prison guards. And so we have this um, crisis inside U.S. jails and prisons where people are left and they're vulnerable and they don't have a camera like we do on the streets and they don't have um, a hashtag like we do with folks who are dying on the streets at the hands of law enforcement. And so I think this case with Sandy Bland is really, really important for us to take a look at the U.S. incarceration system and the impacts it has on black lives. Uh, Patrice Cullors, you've also worked in s specifically on county jails, and Sandra Bland uh, was died, was found dead in a county jail. Could you talk about what the specific uh, context and situation is in county jails as against other uh, uh, prisons in the U.S.? Yes. I mean, the county jail is where you go uh, while you're awaiting trial, uh, before you meet a judge. The county jail is where you go. Um, to uh, really uh, go through the process of um, whether you're going to be prosecuted or not. And so what we've seen, though, across the country as a trend uh, where people are ending up in county jails and being um, completely ne neglected, there's severe medical neglect in county jails, there's a significant amount of beatings that happen in county jails. And so you've seen this um, in Los Angeles County, you've seen this in New York, You've seen this in Chicago and now in uh, Waller County. This isn't um, this isn't new, unfortunate, unfortunately. And Sandy uh, was a victim, a victim of state violence. Opal Tonetti, um, you are involved in immigration issues uh, as well um, as the whole issue of uh, the way authorities treat people of color. You are the daughter of two Nigerian immigrants, executive director of the Black Alliance for Just Immigration. Can you talk about the intersection of um, immigration and um, how people are treated of different hues in this country? Yes. So the reality is that criminalization of people of color is impacting us, whether you're a citizen of the United States or you're not. And what we're seeing right now is the mass criminalization that is leaving low-income people of color, um, immigrant communities, whether you have legal permanent resident status, whether you're undocumented, and it's leaving them particularly vulnerable um, to the whims of local law enforcement and immigration and customs enforcement. What we're seeing now is the deputizing of local law enforcement officials, so police, um, sheriffs, and so on, given the authority to act as though they are ICE agents. And so this leads to all sorts of mishandling of um, cases of folks who might um, be in or out of status in this country. And what we're seeing is that this collusion between immigration and customs enforcement and local law enforcement is causing for rampant 
uh, immigration detention as well as deportation. So the, the vast numbers that we're seeing, the growing numbers, every day we're seeing thousands and thousands of people um, each week being deported. This is a result of the ways in which our immigration system and criminal justice system have now been intertwined. We're going to break and then come back to this discussion. Our guests are uh, Opal Tometi, uh, Alicia Garza and Patrice Cullors, the three co-founders of Black Lives Matter. Stay with us.